The Next Unicorns is brought to you by NetSuite by Oracle, the business management software that handles every aspect of your business in an easy to use cloud platform. Get NetSuite's free guide, seven key strategies to grow your profits when you go to netsuite.com slash twist. LinkedIn, a business is only as strong as its people and every hire matters. Go to linkedin.com slash unicorn and get a $50 credit towards your first job post. And Embroker, the Embroker startup insurance program helps startups secure the most important lines of insurance at a lower cost and with less hassle. Get an instant quote and $5,000 of AWS credits when you become a customer at Embroker.com slash twist. While you're there, get 10% off your policy costs by using offer code TWIST10. All right, everybody, welcome to This Week in Startups. It's going to be a good show today. We're going to talk about the massive change that's happening in life science, and I've got a really amazing founder on the podcast. His name is Sajith. And here we go. Uh, I'm part of the hard last name cl- club too. And you go by Saji, but yeah, Saj- Saji. Sajith is how you pronounce your first name. Sajith. Sa- Sajith. Yeah. Sajith. Got it. Uh, Wikrama Sekora. Wikrama Sekora. Pretty close. Do you do it for me? Go ahead. Uh, Wikrama Sekora. Wikrama Sekora. Yeah. There you go. All right. Got it. Thank you for having me, Jason. Uh, thanks for coming on the pod. You're the CEO and co-founder of Benchling, uh, which you started in 2012. What mm-hmm. does the company do? Uh, In plain English, because remember, we're not all PhDs in life sciences. Sure. We make software that makes biotechnology research faster and more collaborative. Got it. And biotechnology research prior to your enterprise software product Mm -hmm. was inefficient how? Uh, Think of it as an industry that is running on paper, email, and Excel. Got it. So literally, people doing this life science research are typing data into a spreadsheet not always typing, sometimes writing in paper notebooks. Yeah. First, and then transcribing those. Yeah, yeah. And, and then they make some formulas and then make decisions about products and services that we will use to try to extend our lifespan or cure diseases. Yes, more or less. It's biology is all around you, and it's the biggest industry that you're probably not aware of. Right. Yeah. Um, and how did you get into that? Yeah, so this goes this goes back quite yeah. a while. Um, so... Uh, uh, my background's in a mix of software engineering and, and life sciences, so I kind of did both. Yeah. Um, the story for me goes back to growing up in North Carolina. Um, I was, you know, I've been programming most of my life. You know, like many young adolescent males, I got into software because I wanted to work on yeah. video games. Uh, but I went to a, I went to nerd boarding school basically in North Carolina. So I was nerd really, boarding school. I, yeah, wow. I, was, I didn't know it existed. I was, I was very lucky to uh, have the opportunity to go to a boarding school that was run by the state of North Carolina. So their whole thing was, hey, if we we set up a school that's math and science only, hmm. um, and we'll we'll bring people in from all over the state. So if you were like out in the mountains and you didn't have access to a great education, you could come to the school, wow. live there, and like take classes from a bunch of you know PhD professors. All folks on math and science was a really great opportunity. I was lucky enough to go there, and it was styled kind of like university. So you didn't have class all day. You had opportunities to do other things, and they kind of expected you. You got to do more. And you know, I had you know pushy immigrant parents who wanted me to become a doctor, which you know, I had zero interest in, in yeah. doing. Um, but I was willing to try out doing research, and so I you know convinced a professor at a lab at Duke University just down the road to you know hey let me. I'll be some extra hands and, and labor for you and let me work in your lab. This and is in high school. You convinced somebody at Duke to make you a research assistant. Yeah. During and high school. Yeah. And so I... So you're like a Doogie Hauser. Uh, like a Doogie Hauser type thing. <laughs> and, and so I was really... Oh, I'm sorry. Did they did they bully you and call you Doogie <laughs> Hauser when you were there? Not, before, <laughs> before nerd boarding school, yes, but I, I was at home with oh, got all it. the other nerds. Oh, so when you went back to nerd boarding school, yes, they called uh, you Doogie Hauser, okay. but that was a compliment in nerd boarding school. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Did you have a Doogie Hauser poster on your wall? I, I did not. Also, yeah. I, I've never seen that show. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's a cultural reference. It's yeah. basically, uh, what's the guy's name? It's Neil Patrick uh, Neil Patrick Harris. Harris. Yeah, yeah plays a kid who's so smart, he becomes yeah. a doctor. You yeah. were very sure. smart. You became a research analyst. Sure. It's a uh, compliment. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I tried out this research thing, and I I'd actually hated biology before that because I was like, oh, mm. this thing's all about memorization, and you know, I wanted to stick to my programming thing. And it turned out I really liked the problem solving in the lab and and the impact of the mm. work I was doing. You know, I was, I was studying DNA repair and yeast, which sounds like a very esoteric thing, but how DNA gets repaired is very important, how we treat cancer. Yeah. And, and so I, at that point, realized that biology was going to be it for me, and I was going to find a way to blend both computer science and biology together, and I would go have a career in medicine um, and, and work at a biotech company doing doing drug discovery. 
So got to school, you know, college, went to MIT and uh, studying computer science because, again, like I love programming. It was one of my you know, first things I, I loved and I started doing research. And I eventually, you know, at the juncture where I want us to get serious about doing life science research, you know, you got to get a PhD and it's a... Uh, it's an industry that requires a lot of training and investment mm. to you know join the workforce. Um, I actually quit doing research at that time. You know, I, I sort of beelined out. And if I were to, you know, reflecting back on why I did that, if I were to compare and contrast my life as a software engineer and my life as a scientist, they were very different. Mm. And software was just so much more fun. And a lot of people have that epiphany. I don't. I don't think I'm alone. But uh, I had the epiphany because you know a lot of people think that biology takes time to grow. It's too slow. You know, stuff. You know, it's, yeah, it's alive. Yeah, it's slow. Uh, that didn't bother me so much. What bothered me is that it felt really lonely compared to building software. Huh. Software was this incredibly collaborative thing. If I wanted to work with a team of engineers who might be distributed all around the world, I had the tools to do so to collaborate on code effectively. Yeah. And if something about the process of building software sucks, well, you're a software engineer. Make some tools. And if they're good, people will use them. And the industry gets faster, better, cheaper, easier You know, yeah. every year. And more people get to participate in it. Exactly. And if I were to compare that to scientists, now, scientists will really push the envelope when it comes to the the methods and the techniques they use in the lab for doing science. The design of the experiment. Yes, exactly. Things like CRISPR. Like right. Those are amazing step functions that have, you know, come out since I was in the lab, you know, and, and they're wonderful and move science forward in a, in a breakthrough type way. But more or less the way everyone works together in life sciences is based on paper, email, spreadsheets. So literally they're in Excel spreadsheets, typing information. Yep. There are and... paper lab notebooks at Oof. every biotech ac you know, company, academic lab, and those notebooks just sit there and collect dust. Huh. Um, and so these are really, really important problems they're working on, and they're doing it with pretty lame tools. And so the complexity of the scientific work has gone up so much, and so the tools haven't kept pace. So if I were to describe uh, the tool at uh, Benchling, would it be Google Docs for researchers? Uh, would it be a Salesforce CRM or Slack for researchers? How would you describe it in a way that we would understand? Yeah, uh, actually, a lot of those metaphors are pretty good. There are yeah. elements of all those different types of tools that that we have. Um, the thing, though, is that we are we built them in a way that is specific to the life sciences. Got it. And so we have applications that help. We have a suite of applications. They're all unified. So if you're a scientist, you just get to use one tool to do your job. You're not mm. jumping between 10 different Got things. It. So it's like a suite, like the office suite. It is. Word, Excel, Exactly. PowerPoint. Except Word and Excel, in this case, they're going to talk to one another. Got it. So you have tools to design your experiments, tools to document them, tools to track all the materials being produced, both logical tracking, tracking. So think how you like model all the different stuff you're building and how it relates to one another. Yeah. And then physical tracking. So like the supply chain of where all my tubes ah, and how much volume cool. is in them. So it's like a project manager. And instead of just dumping it all in Excel, you've got like a proper project management and yes. product. And then, yeah. And then workflow tools to so how you can place requests ah. to your fellow scientists and how you can hand off experiments from one team to another. And so if, mm. if you're a scientist, you can use this tool, you can do most of your day to day in it. And then for the organization you're a part of, all of a sudden, all of your data is in one single centralized location. You can yeah. ask questions of it. Got it. And how many, I mean, this is, you've been working on this for now. Seven years. Seven years. It's a long time. Yeah, it is. And and you uh, you got, uh, you went to YC at some point. Yeah. A long actually, time ago. Now. Right after we started. Uh, yeah, I had had some friends when I, I was I was in undergrad at MIT, and I was I was working on Benchling, and it was something I was really excited about. Uh, I didn't know much about starting companies, and that wasn't necessarily the goal. But yeah. I had some friends who had been in my combinator, and they said, "Hey, these these guys will give you some money, and you can work on this for a year or two if you're excited about it." And I was like, "That sounds great. Sign me up." Perfect. Um, and you've now gone on to raise sixty one million dollars in a couple of rounds of funding. You just did your Series C this mm -hmm. uh, July, which means you're over a hundred million in valuation pretty easily. Yep. Uh, how many employees now? How many uh, team we're members? About, we're about 150. 150 yeah. already? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we've really uh, grown the team in the last year or two. How do you charge for the product? You charge by experiment? You charge by university? You charge by seed? Is it a SaaS model? Yeah, so the product, um, in the early days, we actually gave it away for free to academic institutes. So think your your PhD students who are yeah. who are just being trained. Um, and we still actually keep the product free for them. That's really important to us. Mm. Um, not all the academic labs in the world have tons of funding, but they're all working on really important research. And so they wanna... can play with it. They can trial it for free. They, they use it for free completely. And huh. you know, for us, it's how we train the next generation of science scientists to use benchling before they go out into industry. Got it. Um, but for companies from small startups to the, you know, household name pharmaceutical companies, everyone everyone knows, yeah. like we charge them per scientist per year. So it's a SaaS model. Like a thousand dollars a scientist, two thousand uh, scientists? A thousand is the lower end. It can Got go, it. you know, I would say the, the large companies can pay us, you know, the seven figures per year. 
uh, wow. Yeah. So thousands of dollars per scientist. Per year, yeah. Which makes sense. I mean, if you, I think Salesforce and some of those tools, you start mm -hmm. hitting low thousands of dollars per year. Yeah. yeah and, I mean, and they live in them. Yeah. And the work that's being done is incredibly valuable. Again, this is the lifeblood of the company. They're going to produce medicines that are going to go to market or other products that are yeah. going to earn the billions of dollars per year. And uh, so yeah, you raised that over a $400 million valuation. That's kind of <laughs> mind blowing yeah. for you. Yeah. Yeah. What did your parents do? I'm curious. That they, uh, they saw they obviously saw the massive value in you going to this nerd, uh, yeah. <laughs> as you call it. I don't nerd think they saw the value school. in me quitting uh, MIT though. <laughs> yeah, were they immigrants? Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, from, and you it told me before from Sri Lanka. Yeah, from Sri Lanka. Yeah. Uh, so my my dad came here for for school to do his PhD in electrical engineering. Oh wow! Uh, in North Carolina. Uh, so they valued it. Yeah. The education absolutely. deeply. Yeah, I've got a couple of friends who are Sri Lankan. Presh, who works for me. Yeah. And then my friend Jamal Palihapitiya, who is, I think, the most famous Sri Lankan. He's definitely the most in famous in the Bay Area, for sure. Maybe okay. in America. <laughs> is there a more famous Sri Lankan in America than Chamath uh -huh. Palihapitiya? Let's think about it. <laughs> Who's the Sri Lankan in the NBA? Is there a Sri Lankan in the NBA? No. You gotta go Has to there like, been? I don't think so. You have to no. go to like cricket to start finding Yeah, Sri that's right. People, yeah. What's the population of Sri Lanka? I'm curious. Uh, 20 million, 30 million? Probably about, yeah. Some. It's not a major... Uh, population size. Yeah, but, 20 million sounds about right. Yeah. All right, when we get back from this break, I've got you here and you know all about this stuff and you're seeing all the trends. And what I want to know is what, I, I got a lot of questions because I am a neophyte. I don't invest in this area. Sure. But when I have somebody who's got some level of familiar, familiarity with it, I like to ask them about some of the topics I'm seeing all the time. And a couple of them that I find super interesting is this uh, immunotherapy mm -hmm. with curing cancer mm -hmm. and your your own blood and like this custom ther custom therapeutics? Yeah, personalized medicine. It? Personalized medicine. Yep. I want to know what that's going to do to lifespans mm -hmm. of people in, let's say, our generation, Gen X and Millennial. When we get back on this week in startups. Hey, everybody. I'm here with my friend Jason Maynard, who works at NetSuite. Tell everybody, what do you do, Jason? You know, I do I do many things here at NetSuite, but I run the field operations for the business unit. Fundamentals matter. They right? do. I mean, I think it's part of the promise of what you're doing at NetSuite is to make sure people have strong fundamentals. So the business itself, which is going to be complex, which is going to have ups and downs, but you're going to face competition. You're going to face losing employees to other companies. You're going to face accounting or cash flow issues at some point. You want to have all that stuff tight. Everybody says this is like the most chaotic time in business, and I can't remember any period in business that wasn't chaotic. It's always chaos. It's always change. Yeah. So the, the key is, how do you become resilient as an organization that you can withstand change? And, and that, I think that's one of those lessons you learn. If you've been around for a little while, 20 plus years, we've been through nothing but change. Part of it is you got to be a grinder. You got to embrace the mundane, you know, whether you're a basketball team or a football team or a software company, you got to embrace that everyday practice grind. And it's not always super sexy. All right. Right now, NetSuite is offering you valuable insights with a free guide, the seven key strategies to grow your profits. So go to NetSuite.com slash twist, NetSuite.com slash twist, and get that free guide, seven key strategies to grow your profits. We appreciate the work you're doing in the startup community. It's great Thanks, stuff. Thanks, pal. Thanks. All right. We'll be back with more. All right, the CEO and co-founder of Benchling, that's Benchling.com, uh, is here. Uh, Saji, when we went to break, uh, we were talking about your company and mm -hmm. you work with all of these uh, major life sciences companies. Am I correct in that this immunotherapy and this customized drugs is the most promising uh, aspect of life expansion, life extension for humanity? Is this the most promising thing that scientists that use your software are working on yeah it's it is it's, uh it is the most exciting thing in medicine right now and i would say it's a bit broader than just immunotherapy so i think the big shift that's happening is from chemistry to biology so we can do a really basic science lesson right let's now let's do it want. yeah um, please. so when you think about drugs in general think like advil or aspirin you know medicines that everyone knows about those are what are called small molecule drugs small molecule drugs yes. got it and so they're made through a chemistry based process and they're literally small molecules so if you had a whiteboard i could if i was a chemist i could draw a structure on that whiteboard yep and a chemist would look at it and i'm simplifying but they'd more or less be able to like mix some stuff together and, and make it and different that's, compounds different elements yeah and so that's how most medicines have been made historically last 50 years uh, but if you plot the the graph of r d productivity so dollars we invest in r d how many drugs do we get out right um that graph looks pretty bad we're now spending three four billion dollars if you bake in all the failures to get one drug to the market 
And that one drug may not even move the needle in some not. significant way. Yeah, it may only be an incremental improvement over what we have. We're not going to, to be honest though, like we're not going to, it's not like the industry is like bad at this. Like we're not going to, it's just that we have a bunch of good drugs. Like we're not going to make an Advil that's 10x better than Advil or a better aspirin. Or because better physics of molecules. Or they just do a good job. Yeah, but yeah. we've sort of but exhausted that, right? Yeah, a, a lot way? of the low hanging fruit is gone. That's exactly it. it. Um, but the where's the high hanging fruit? Is it in the Amazon at the bottom of the ocean? It kind of is because now we're trying to do things like cure a genetic defect or treat Alzheimer's. We're trying to do stuff that is way higher stakes and higher value than we uh, previously did before. We're not just right. treating the symptoms of disease. Not a headache, not shoulder pain. Yeah, this is cancer in people's yeah. lives and you know neurodegenerative disorders and so forth. Wow. And so we need new tools for doing that. And so the industry has really been shifting from being heavily chemistry focused to heavily biology focused. Got it. And so we're leveraging human biology to do this. And so now mm. we're making large molecules instead of small molecules. And as the name sounds, they're much larger. I, I couldn't draw the structure of one of these drugs on a whiteboard. And instead, the way we make them, a human doesn't make them. We re-engineer organisms and kind of use them as these cellular factories to produce these large molecules. So okay. we're taking advantage of what exists in nature and we're editing DNA. Give me there. an example of this that exists today. Yeah. Um, some of the most famous, uh, I'm trying to think of names that people would know, but uh, some of the most famous breast cancer drugs, for example, yeah. are what are called monoclonal antibodies. They're almost like homing missiles that can target specific uh specific mutations in, in DNA, and these are what are called biologics. We, they're proteins, and we, we grow them up in a bioreactor. Not too different from how we would, like, ferment, like, alcohol Beer. or something. Exactly. Um, yeah, it literally is like a bucket where you're fermenting. Mm -hmm. and, you're ex and these organisms are secreting, so you're extracting some compound that the organisms huh. are producing. Wow. Yeah. What do you put into the bucket when you start? Uh, well, many, like, this is a decade of work that goes in before yeah. that to re-engineer an organism to produce a molecule that has the effect that you want. Got it. Um, and so we've got this new class of medicines, and some of them fall into the category of uh, immunotherapies, where we are able to take a patient's cells, re-engineer them, wow. and then combine that with other existing treatments, whether it's antibodies or other types of drugs, and, you know, supercharge a patient's immune system to go, you know, fight cancer. Which is actually working today. It is working today. It's uh, the there was a Nobel Prize that was won for work on immunotherapy. I think last year there there are two medicines on the market in the U.S. that mm. take advantage of this. There's one that's a gene therapy that treats you know blindness in children that's on the market. So it's it's very early innings for this type of medicine. How Where early? Like uh, when did it start? And when did we first start putting it in humans? Uh, Two years ago was the first approved medicine in humans for, yeah. for these cell therapies. Uh, so it's it's very early innings. But and we were talking about these, though, what, 10, 15 years ago? It's, we've been talking about it for a long time. Um, yeah. But this, sometimes the science just takes a long time to get from the, you know, basic discovery phase in academic labs all the way to, you know, works in people. If only people had software, yeah. <laughs> enterprise software that would make that <laughs> journey more efficient, which is kind of what you're doing. You're That's literally we're making the tools yeah. to help them compress that timeline, aren't Ab you? Absolutely. We're trying to help them get more shots on goal to do it quicker, make better decisions. More into, shots on goal. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So breast cancer used to be surgery. Um, I think there was also chemotherapy. Mm-hmm. Um, was there hormone therapy as well for it, or is that mostly for prostate cancer? Uh, I'm a little bit far yeah. from inside. Yeah. I'm not sure. So now we're going to be able to do this. Uh, for different types of cancers, yeah. actually, some of the most promising, for immunotherapy specifically, some of the most promising cancers are ones that we've actually had no treatments for before. They're, they're actually like blood cancers in little children. Huh. Uh, it's like different leukemias that were really hard for us to address before. And, and now it's, it's still you know small populations that we're testing this on, but mm -hmm. the results have been miraculous. Okay, now, another thing I hear about on the periphery with other investors is the 3D printing mm -hmm. and or creation of new organs for humans. Now, yep. this was something that was in science fiction 10, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. We'd create a clone of ourselves, then we'd harvest the, um, the various organs from a human. But my understanding is now is that we're 3D printing some easily printable like parts of the heart and valves maybe with biological material yeah so that's that's a huge area of active investment and mm -hmm. another area another sort of angle on that is where at this point 
trying to figure out how we can grow up organs in animals and then transplant them over to humans. Wow. Because um, as crazy as it sounds, like genetically, some animals are like not too far off. Pigs and dogs. From humans. And pigs we, are the most common? Yeah, pigs are, are definitely very well studied. And it's something that I think people are, think is a lot of promise. Uh, well, who's the closest then? Would it be like a primate? Uh, a, a pig is, I think pigs and primates tend to be the most well studied um, wow. for this kind of purpose. And the thought is that with techniques like CRISPR, where we can do gene editing, okay. um, maybe we can figure out a way to kind of trick the body into thinking that, hey, this isn't actually a pig organ. It's okay. And don't reject it. Wow. Where are we on that timeline? Because uh, you have people studying that using your software, I take it? Uh, we actually do have a couple of companies that work on xenotransplantation using Benchling. Xenotransplantation. Yeah. That's a fancy way of saying Dang. cross species yes. <laughs> creation of organs. Yeah. Uh, Can you imagine the moral outrage and debate this is going to spur? It hasn't really happened yet, has it? I think the, the gene editing debate is gonna when it's gonna be much more visceral when it comes to like for example earlier this year someone in china edited human embryos yes and that i think caused huge what did they do they were doing something with twins or something and they yeah. went, wound up going to jail uh they were trying to demonstrate that they could cure hiv or make some change to it in huh. uh, uh baby embryos which is uh there's a it's illegal to do in the u.s to be clear. Uh, you cannot make babies in Petri dishes and do science in the United States on them. Yeah, you cannot edit the like embryos, yeah. Right. Um, and so I think the, but the scientific community has been- Sh Let's stop for a second <laughs> and talk about that. Editing of a human embryo. So this is a tiny, tiny speck mm -hmm. of a human mm -hmm. that has- It's a clump of cells, yeah. A clump of cells that would be the size of a, I don't know, sand or a pea or something. Much smaller. <laughs> Much smaller. Yeah. I and mean, we're down to the embryo level. You, yeah. You're on a super microscope to see yeah. this. And they're editing it with no intention of that. Oh, no, they're going to insert it into, to, to be brought to uh, In this birth. case, I think it was. Um, yeah. But generally speaking, in the U.S., when people want to do something, that's more for research purposes. The goal is not to, you know, have a genetically modified baby that is wow. born. Yeah, that's a kind of a cro crossing an ethical line at this point. In America, but we are at the moment now where we are, or some people in humanity on the planet are editing mm -hmm. human embryos. Y yes. What do you think is actually going on in places with high science, but maybe low, you know, or, or fluid, <laughs> um, fluid interpretations of the sure. ethics here? Sure. Uh, I think it's important. Trying to be to graceful. Here. Yeah, yeah. I think it's important to remember that the science is still very early. There's no, we're not, you know, there aren't going to be gene edited babies walking around China next week. Like mm. we're still figuring out how to deliver these medicines, how to make sure they're doing the editing reliably and precisely and safely. So mm. it's going to be a while before we see that kind of, yeah. uh, that, that come to fruition. Where it is being used in a more positive way is in treatments of different diseases and as a model to study uh, different organisms and, and study different diseases in the lab. Mm. Yeah. Here's the, um, here's just a quick recap from the Wikipedia. The Lulu and Nana controversy revolves around twin Chinese girls born in October 2018 who have been given the pseudonyms Lulu and Nana. According to the research, He Jiang Kui, uh, the twins are the world's first germline genetically edited babies. Girls were born healthy. The girls' parents participated in a clinical project run by he, who is offered standard in vitro fertilization service. In addition, use CRISPR, Cas9, a mm -hmm. technology that can modify DNA. Yep. To modify the CCR5 gene in the embryos that were generated to attempt to confer genetic resistance to the HIV virus. And this was done in secretly. Well, it was done in secrecy. Yeah. So his intent was to make, to flip that CCR5 gene mm -hmm. in some way, yep. to modify or flip it. And, and make the then, babies immune to HIV. Wow. In 2019, lawyers in China reported, in light of the purported creation by Chinese scientist He Jiang Kui of the first gene-edited humans, the drafting regulations that require anybody to play the human genome by Gene editors like CRISPR would be held responsible for any related adverse consequences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that crossed the line, and it's not something the research community is willing to support right now.
Yeah. Yeah. When do you think we will hit that moment when we feel so good about the technology, we've been so confident in it, that we'll want to do, which this person obviously had good intent to, to make people immune to HIV. It's, mm -hmm. it's on a short list of what could be one of the most beautiful things you could do for humanity. Yeah, good intent, ill thought out. Right. You know, so output, when but. would this same approach mm -hmm. not be ill thought out, but be appropriate for us to deploy in terms of the number of years from now, 20 years from now, above or below when we get back on This Week in Startups. Oh my God, I love LinkedIn for hiring. I have hired three out of the last four people on my team through LinkedIn. Hold on a second. Three out of the last four came from LinkedIn and they are crushing it for me. Amazingly talented people are on LinkedIn every day. And some of them are not looking for jobs. They're just doing their messages, reading their feed, getting all the great content, all the great groups, all the great news, all the great articles and influencers. They're just living on LinkedIn, just like you do. You've been on LinkedIn all day today, I'm sure of it. Over 600 million people visit LinkedIn and search for jobs and a new hire is made every eight seconds. Huh? And that's where you're gonna find those qualified people. And here's Presh putting up a job posting for our new client success manager position in our Toronto office. Because we can't find people in San Francisco very easily. So we're tapping other markets and we use LinkedIn to do that strategy. And my associate, Presh, huh? he's not CMO anymore, he's an associate on the investment team. He is going on uh, to LinkedIn and typing in a bunch of what we're looking for uh, in terms of the skills needed and the description. Maybe adds a couple of screening questions, which I love. And then he sets the daily budget and zoom, zoom, zoom. Here we go. We start getting candidates all within a couple of minutes. It's so simple. It's so easy. And I want to give you $50, a 50, a 5 -oh, just for typing the word unicorn, U-N-I-C-O-R-N. -N. You know how to type unicorn and you are building a unicorn right now with the help of your team that you're going to source on LinkedIn. So why don't, why don't we just give you $50 right now? LinkedIn.com slash unicorn. Can you remember it? LinkedIn.com. That's already in your history. It's going to autofill it. Slash unicorn. As in the company you're building with the incredibly talented people you find on LinkedIn. $50. Terms and conditions apply because it's 50 bucks, obviously. Let's get back to this amazing episode. All right. Sajay and I are having a really interesting conversation <laughs> about CRISPR. Um and genetically edited babies, of which we now have two on the planet. Mm -hmm. Is that literally true? These are the first two? I believe they're the first two reported. Got it. Okay, so yeah. we can assume that there are others that we are uh, not aware of, I, in all likelihood. It's pr This is Gotta really be great challenging science. Yeah. Um, oh, so there's a few number of people who could do it. Very likely, and it's, you know, you're talking research universities. And, okay. Yeah. It takes the equipment is, is super expensive and complicated. Is that the issue? Yeah, that's part of, uh, it's, it's, well, it's not necessarily that, but like, you know, access to this kind of material, like how do you just get human embryos? Like uh, most universities have pretty strong ethics boards in place to make sure this doesn't happen. There's it. a lot of controls to make sure this isn't, you know, going wild. Right. I wonder how this actually became news. I wonder how he... He published a paper about it. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so he said, hey, I did this here's thing. my results. Yeah, yeah. Wow. What was it like in, the, in your community when they saw this? Were people just aghast that this actually occurred in the world? They were. All of the leading researchers who helped discover the CRISPR technology, they kind of raised their hand and said like, hey, this is not okay. And like we as a community need to talk about it. So I think at least the majority huh. of the scientific community that I think we're part of, I think responded really, really well. That's which good. Which was to bring the experts who are at the forefront of this technology together to talk about it, to make sure that everyone agreed on sort of the rules of engagement, what you can and can't do. And yeah. by the way, what, what was done was definitely illegal in the US. So never happened here it was illegal here <clears throat> and it wasn't legal there they've just added a law that you're yeah. responsible for whatever happens adverse effects which yeah. is kind of a review mirror type yeah legal wording who knows what's correct there it's, it is china so we're not sure but when we left for break we will get to the point where the CRISPR community the ethical moral mm -hmm. uh leaders in science uh, will say yeah it's time for us to genetically edit and solve some of these problems mm -hmm. for humanity. Yeah. I put a line. You gamble at all? Yeah. You, like you like a little poker? Poker, yeah. You like a little poker? A yeah. little Hold'em, PLO? What do you like? Uh, a little mixed game? I'm not really good at PLO, so mostly Hold'em. A little yeah. Hold'em, okay. Well, I, I know a game <laughs> if you're interested in playing. Uh, it looks like you're doing okay with that $400 million valuation, so you might have a seat. Um, 
I'm going to set the line at 20 years. Mm -hmm. Would you say the scientific community in America would say, okay, let's start slowly engaging in this type of behavior, the same exact scenario, the Lulu and Nana controversy. Would that happen in under 20 years or over 20 years? This Which exact, side would you take? This exact scenario? This exact scenario. I would go under 20 on that. Really? I would. Um, but I, I think putting you know, baby embryos aside, something yeah. that's not totally dissimilar is actually happening today in like a healthy and positive way, which is that for certain types of diseases, mm. we're able to deliver medicines that can correct a genetic defect. So like a, it's called like ah. a gene therapy as an example. And so think of things like cystic fibrosis or yeah. specific types of muscular dystrophy or even the first gene therapy in the US, which was approved a couple years ago, which is basically an injection to the eye of uh, you know, something that can correct mm. for a faulty protein being produced and and save children from being, you know, congenital blindness. So you think cystic fibrosis could be resolved through this technique post being born? Uh, yeah, hopefully for diseases like that, we can mm. make uh, ones that are chronic and have a terribly debilitating effect on you know a yeah. child's life. We can make those diseases bear. We can fix the underlying issue. So we don't have to change and modify the DNA at the embryo mm -hmm. time scale. Yeah. We can wait yeah. until the person is five years old mm -hmm. and then send in an immunotherapy. Uh, immunotherapy is something a little bit different. A little different. Yeah, this so would be a gene therapy. A gene therapy. Yeah. How does a gene therapy get deployed in a human? Yeah, um, delivery is actually a really tough part of it. Yeah. Um, this is gonna sound crazy, but sometimes we use viruses. Um, so we okay. take a virus that would normally not be so great for a human and we mm. like kind of use it as like a, a a delivery vehicle. Okay, it's like because, the it's like the syringe. Yeah, and and so we can find a way to deliver. Maybe maybe we're correcting a genetic defect. So huh. hey, the body can't produce this one protein well. We're gonna fix that. Or maybe we're just taking the protein and, and sending it into the human. You can't make it on your own, but we'll give it to you. It's just like a Trojan horse coming in there. Yeah, yeah. Would it? I'm definitely simplifying the science a little bit, but no. But yeah. I, and I like it. I think it's like an important discussion for people to have because these this, gene therapies are happening today. Yeah. What are the first couple of dominoes that will fall in this, you know, genome therapy? Yeah. Um, so for gene therapy, yeah, I would look to, they're typically going to be rarer diseases. Uh -huh. um, and they're going to be for diseases whose underlying biology is more simple. Mm -hmm. So maybe not that they're any simple disease. It's all actually very hard. But mm -hmm. uh, diseases where there might be, you know, one mutation, you know, Got one it. one T is a C and something like that, that where we can kind of easily identify model disease and treat it. Yeah. Where do the brain diseases oh. live on this spectrum? Because it does seem to me that our human physical, you know, carcasses that mm -hmm. house us seem to be making it further and further but our brains are not lasting as long as our muscles and bones. Yeah, neurodegenerative disorders, your Alzheimer's, stuff like that. Those, that's the almost the holy grail of medicine. Yeah, that's they're really Why hard. Why is that? Because the brain's complex in its structure. Uh, extremely complex, not well understood. Extremely hard to test too, because you know Alzheimer's. Think of that. That's a yeah. disease where when you you know, image a patient's brain after you know many years of that, there's there's not a lot left. So if there's not mm -hmm. left, how do you how do you treat it? It's almost you have to be like prophylactic about it. And wow. Yeah, so it's extremely hard to test. Um, you know, obviously a massive market and extremely important in the US worldwide. So companies are, are working really hard on it, but it, it is a graveyard of failures. There, are, I don't think there are any Alzheimer's medicines out on the market. Yeah. And so that one, you take the over 20 years that we'll be able I'm, to manage it or I'm, reverse I'm, it? I don't know about reversal, but uh, that seems hard given that you're physically, you know, the brain is deteriorating. Yeah. But in terms of slow the progression or, you know, have some way to prevent it, I, I would still take under on 20 years. I'm, I'm like macro optimist on this stuff. Really? Five years, I'm definitely over on that. But under 20, mm -hmm. like 10 years ago, we didn't have CRISPR. We didn't have immunotherapy. Next generation DNA sequencing was still extremely expensive. Like, I think we underestimate the progress we can make in a decade. When you look at these crazy scientific discoveries, how do you assess them and how should we assess them when trying to figure out if this is quackery or brilliant? Like I am amazed by the number of startups that come to me with CBD products 
<laughs> and they say this is going to cure anxiety <laughs> and muscle relief. I mean, literally the list of things that CBD cures, <laughs> it would put you out of business, Saji. Like, there's no need for benchling anymore because we just rub some CBD on don't, it. And, don't tell our customers. They'll stop doing yeah, their research. <laughs> exactly. No need to do research, folks. Just rub a little <laughs> CBD, CBD oil on it. <laughs> but the CBD does nothing. It, w why do people believe that this solves everything when, and, and how do you look at when people say that kind of stuff and they make these crazy claims, but then there's some things that seem crazy, like we're talking about CRISPR here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the same investors will get pitched on a CRISPR project and they get pitched on a CBD and I'm looking at it going like, well, yeah, both of them seem equally crazy and insane. Yeah, well, the the lucky thing is in the U.S. we have this you know wonderful body called the FDA, and, <laughs> and they're gonna you have to in order to get a medicine and, and market it as yeah. such, you got to run it through a clinical trial, and you need got to show it. that hey, this actually has a material effect on a patient population, and right. it's not just some anecdotes. Yeah. Um, CBD aside, you know, I'm not I'm not a huge expert on that, and yeah. I don't think most of our our customers. Although I think there's like there is merit in something there, like sure, why not leveraging similar solutions for thousands of years and yeah i mean thc obviously yeah. helps people with pain yeah. uh, and mit pain mitigation yeah. that so there's something there and there's something people, there there are people who do you know legit biotech research on the underlying like cannabinoids mm -hmm. that are in thc so yeah. there's, there's definitely stuff there is it a miracle cure probably not um there aren't yeah. any is it much bowl. better than opioids Definitely, likely very much likely very yes. much likely yeah. we could go out of the limb and say yes much the better for society of being addicted to edibles mm. and versus opioids i think we're gonna it's a better gamble to take yeah i yeah. think I'm, we're yeah. all gonna see that flop <laughs> yeah but in the term in in terms of you know quackery and not that's that's really tough because sometimes science stuff that is quackery ends up being true i think immunotherapy is like a really great example of this where uh there was a period of time where the people who believed in you know leveraging the patient's immune system to fight mm -hmm. cancer those people were the quacks in science for a little bit huh. and if you look back you know 100 years you find all these these records of patients who are at a hospital and, and back then you know hygiene wasn't very good so you had a lot of like infections at the hospital yeah. you know, doctors didn't wash their hands and stuff like that might be a little further back than 1900 but uh so you have these, these i think it was still happening in the 50s if you read this book the checklist manifest Festo. Oh, yeah, right there. <laughs> it's right. I don't know if you've ever read it. I have read it. It's a great book. You have book. read it. Yeah. I mean, they basically came up with this device because doctors who think they're gods sometimes yeah. refuse to wash their goddamn hands yeah. <laughs> and the tools and they just made it mandatory. Cuts down errors. Yeah. And they, and they put like a little um, caps, a little like tent over the surgical tools mm -hmm. to show that they were sterilized Yep. and they would remove the tent. And the doctors wouldn't do it, so they just had the nurses do it. Yep. And then all of a sudden, people stopped dying in surgery because mm -hmm. they don't get septic shock. Yeah, same thing happened with washing your hands at some point. And so you you had, you know, doctors weren't washing their hands, whatever, and patients get infections. And they might have cancer. And all of a sudden, they get this 104-degree fever, and the cancer miraculously disappears. And there's a couple cases like that through history. And so some doctors began to formulate the hypothesis that, like, hey, the immune system went into overdrive, uh -huh. and, like, it took care of the cancer. And for a long time, though, that, that fell out of fashion at some point, and those people were the quacks, but then it made a comeback. Like, some people really believed, and now immunotherapy is one of the most promising breakthroughs that we have to treat cancer. Turns out cancer had a way to kind of trick the immune system and say, like, hey, I'm a good guy. Don't, don't like, yeah. go crazy on me. And these people figured out how to how to deal with that and block wow. that so that the, and then we could take a patient's immune cells out, you know, engineer them, put them back in, and more or less, you know, go crazy on the, on the cancer. This sounds crazy. But it some, is crazy. It's it, total science fiction, but we're living in it right now. And the other thing that sort of, by extension, seems crazy right now is there are people who believe that positivity and seeing your loved ones and talking to them and joy and what some mental state could also uh, put people into remission uh, or cure cancer. Maybe not totally alone, but I'm sure like attitude and outlook have a big impact. Right. Like, you know, if you're like fighting cancer is like a tough thing, um, yeah. like it's probably really draining. And if you give up, like you, you, you so know, human biology is very complex and not well understood. So I wouldn't be surprised if that had some effect. Could be correlation between fighters and remission, but it might not be causation. Yeah, it would. I, I would hesitate to say causation. And I yeah. think like, you know, it's important to have that outlook and go see a doctor and get medical treatment. And yeah, I mean, Steve Jobs, Jobs yeah. tragically yeah. thought he could- Use a diet to use beat pancreatic cancer, yeah. Which everybody told him like, Steve, pancreatic cancer is no joke. You're not gonna solve it with diet. Mm -hmm. 
It's crazy. Yeah. He would have survived? Uh, I'm it's not possible. an MD. But it is possible. Yeah. People survive. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's one of the tough ones, right? He had, like, he had a rare form, though, that was treatable. Um, oh. So maybe if he you know, took the treatments earlier, you wow. know, possibly. But hey, I, I'm, I'm not a no. It's crazy. All right, when we get back from this <laughs> final break, I want to talk to you about nutrition. Okay. There's a new movement that, hey, maybe what we're putting in our bodies is causing a lot of these problems. Maybe our bodies, obesity seems to be a huge uh, mm-hmm. problem. And then there's a bunch of people, and I see this on a pretty regular basis with alternative meats um, mm-hmm. and then genetically modified foods, which for some reason people seem to think saying genetically modified foods equals automatically bad. Mm. What I want to know from you is what are your concerns about genetically modified foods? And is this all overblown? Like, isn't genetically modifying them for the good this incredible has mm-hmm. incredible potential? Yes or no, when we get back on This Week in Startups. All right, listen, you need to have insurance for your startup. I do. And with me today, Matt Miller from Embroker. He's the CEO and founder. Welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me, Jason. Tell me an insurance horror story. Somebody who didn't have insurance and how bad it got for them. Because you must have done some customer uh, research uh, when you started this company. Yeah, I'd say we, we see that happen uh, a number of times. We try to prevent it, obviously, but yeah. where a company just didn't buy insurance and something goes really, really wrong. I'd say one of the... Uh, worst things we've seen is a fight between founders where they actually sue each other and rather than being able to settle it or manage it they end up turning the company bankrupt and actually running up personal debts rather than oh my god anything else how would insurance have helped that situation exactly if you have a director's and officer's policy that uh, can cover that type of liability, it can pay for law- lawyers to settle the lawsuit, it can Got pay it. for damages, and it can just help you manage through those type of things. Awesome. How does a startup's risk change over time from being just two people building an MVP to, say, having 20 employees and a million dollars in revenue as a software enterprise software company? How would that change over that period? As you grow as a startup, the risk that you take on uh, grows as well. So when you sign larger contracts with larger organizations, the potential liability you have, if those things go wrong, also increases. Get an instant quote and the $5,000 in AWS credits right now by going to embroker.com slash twist. And when you check out, use twist10 to get 10% off. Thanks for coming in, Matt. Thanks for having me, Jason. All right. We've got an under... Uh, reported on founder, Saji, from Benchling.com. You don't do a lot of press, do you? No. Pretty quiet. Put your head down, you do the work. That's, uh, that's the style of our software. We're, we're behind the scenes. We help the customers who are doing the really yeah. exciting stuff, you know, yeah. making medicines, meatless meats, yeah. you know, new kinds of materials, you name it. So we went to that break. I was uh, wondering about two things. Take it in whatever order you like. Genetically modified food, I mean, people are freaking out about this, Mm -hmm. seems to me to be like something we want to do. Yeah, I think so. So we do want genetically modified foods. This would be something good. To be clear, we have been genetically modifying foods for thousands of years. Yeah, we take two husks of corn Mm -hmm. and the big ones, we put them together, right? Exactly. That's genetically modified. Exactly. And, And every day, you know, all cells get lots of mutations randomly. And so, you know, all the crops we, you know, the, there's ultraviolet light, the sun, like these these crops are getting naturally genetically modified. Yeah, the and genetic so we, modification is a description of what occurs in nature. Yes. It's evolution. Absolutely. And so we've been doing that for, for thousands of years, and now we just figure out how to speed up the clock cycle of that a little bit as yeah. in a lab. And the downside of making genetically modified corn or wheat is what? I don't understand what the downside is. Um, there, I think there are certainly people have ethical questions about the business practice around it. But in, from my perspective, I think it's it's great. You know, there are lots of places in the world where food is not plentiful, yeah. and having a way to increase the yield of crops like that's a win for them. Or you know, you have areas where kids have specific vitamin deficiencies, and being able to make sure that we re-engineer foods to have the right profile of vitamins so that they're they're healthier yeah. for those kids, like all huge wins or in the case of meatless meat you have the environment to think about where meat production is you know one of the leading causes of global warming yeah and so if we can make taste tasty and healthy meat that's you know doesn't 
you know, require the you know animal husbandry, that's a huge win for everyone. Yeah, I mean, people don't know, but there was this really good book, Why We're Fat, and it talked about mm-hmm. the creation of dwarf wheat okay. back in the 70s. Mm-hmm. And they just had a contest, like a, almost like a, a prize to see who could make the most um, wheat per like hectare acre or whatever they do. And as they genetically modified the crops, they just were able to have less husk, mm-hmm. which means a little bit less fiber, but bigger and bigger, uh, you know, uh, pieces of wheat. Mm-hmm. And what happened was it got so heavy, it made the wheat, you know, the big long mm-hmm. stalks of wheat fall over. And that's evolution at work. And that's evolution yeah, at work. And like- so then they made them shorter. And they're like, oh, if we make the wheat shorter, and it's not 12 feet amber waves mm-hmm. of whatever, we just make it lower, then it won't fall over. Mm-hmm. And that's how we made this incredible flour that's a little bit too refined, mm-hmm. which is why we can make like these desserts, like these cupcakes that are super fine, uh, but they convert into glucose very quickly in your bloodstream is my understanding. So you eat yeah. it, it spikes your blood. So you just have to be aware of what we're mm-hmm. actually creating. But Everything in moderation. And everything in moderation. But this 3D printed food or food in a so lab, it's, it's like there's two flavors. You have you have lab grown meat where you've actually got you've got you know meat tissue almost from an animal, yeah. and you're you're culturing that, you're growing it, and then you've got the folks who are a different approach, same problem where they're assembling meat out of plant. Right. Yeah. So two different flavors. So Impossible Burger is just assembling out of plant. That one's a plant based. Yeah, and um, that's in market, and people love mm-hmm. it. There's another company, I think Memphis Meats, that that grows it up in the lab. There, there are a lot of companies doing this all yeah. now for seafood and chicken and other yeah. different things. And yeah. It tastes good. Yeah. I'm, it's already I'm, okay to good. Yeah. Which means in another five years or 10 mm-hmm. years, it's going to be great. Mm-hmm. And in 20 years, we might- you We'll know, prefer it. Maybe, yeah. Of course we're going to prefer it. I mean, yeah. think about the course of history. Like, if we're starting with, it's good now. Mm-hmm. And like, sometimes I'll have an Impossible Burger and I'm satisfied with mm-hmm. it. it. It tastes different, but it's kind of satisfying. We could actually make a steak that had maybe some lighterness to it. Mm-hmm. But that had the richness of, you know, a Wagyu steak or a Kobe steak or yeah. Miyazaki. I mean, 15 years will probably like, you know, real meat will probably be some high-end dining experience that people go yeah. to, you know, as a, as a separate thing. Or and savage. And, yeah. <laughs> or savage. I yeah. mean, we may look at this part in history in mm-hmm. factory farming as like this great uh, tragedy. Our grandkids may look at us like. What really? We doing? Yeah. You guys had like millions of cows on giant slaughter farms and you just butchered them constantly and like it's gonna be a weird reckoning mm-hmm. i think when we look back on this era um but yeah wow science but the same complex biology being used to make the meatless meats yeah not too different from what's being used to make the next generation of medicines and, and materials and so forth so uh, i think that and that just kind of ties things back to the fact that like this huge shift to biology is, is happening now so this huge shift to biology was driven by the computer, the p- computing power in part? Um, I think computing power is helping cope with the massive amount of data that's being generated yeah. with this shift. But really, it's like scientific ingenuity, new techniques, um, whether it is learning how to har- you know, harness immunotherapy the first time or making the first antibodies or learning mm-hmm. how to deliver gene therapy. Like, you know, by necessity, scientists have moved on and made new tools and the industry is adopting them so that we can, you know, make the next set of products and medicines. If you could wave a magic wand Mm -hmm. and say this would be the ultimate way to solve society's problems that could be solved by Mm -hmm. uh, science and this process, what would you do? Because it seems like we have this very like political academic environment. Then we have the corporate interests Mm -hmm. and everything, you know, capitalism drives people. Mm -hmm. It also can get a little funky. Yeah. Is there something we should be doing Call it a Manhattan Project of food or a Manhattan Project of, you know, CRISPR and bioscience Mm -hmm. and, you know, DNA and immunotherapy. Should this be done in a a more centralized way? Because we think sometimes centralization would get us further. Mm -hmm. Or is the messy, multi-state, multi, you know, corporate interest versus academic, is it actually kind of brilliant in its chaotic approach? It's kind of brilliant and kind of works. Um, I would say that the one thing the government has to do is not cut funding for basic Uh. research. So it's really important that you're allowing people in academia, grad students and whatnot Uh. to like push the boundaries of science. 
And then companies do a good job. There's actually a lot of work that goes from taking a proof of concept from academia and turning it into a drug. Mm. Like that takes decades. And, and if you look at all the top companies in the world by R&D spending, you're going to see like Apple up there, but you're also going to see mostly biotech and life science companies. Got it. So tremendous amounts of R&D investment. And so I think like, you know, earlier we were talking about the cost of making a drug. Like all that money is going to R&D. It's incredibly expensive. Um, so the system does kind of work, though. Obviously, we need to make it more efficient. We need to make it faster. You know, it, we got to get down cycle times from taking 10, 15 years to make a drug. Like the mm -hmm. faster we get it, the more patients benefit. Um, but it, it sort of works in this case. And don't get me wrong. I think the biopharma industry has a PR problem. People see drug pricing and, you know, it's easy to get up in arms about that. But there's yeah. a lot of good work going on under the hood. Yeah, you know, I look at the drug pricing thing mm -hmm. and it definitely seems on the margins mm -hmm. that there's abuse. Yeah. It's, and people go a little crazy. Yeah. it's There are certain, it actually tends to be regulatory when there's abuse where the, you know, there are certain laws that govern how we can make generic drugs and how we can test yeah. our competitors to the brand name drugs and so forth. And I think those, especially in the case of like insulin and so forth, there there's... There's some skullduggery get you know involved there. Yeah, that's not great. But by and large, when you do see these big sticker prices for you know million dollar medicines and so forth, those medicines are doing incredible things like curing a disease, and they're doing it for a very specific population. It's you know it's some rare disease, and yes, it's not great that the system has to absorb the shock. But you know the company spent hundreds of millions of dollars on R and D to get that treatment to market. Yeah, but then you have this guy like Screlly. I don't know if you remember that dipshit yeah. kid on yeah. Twitter. who's running it for everyone else. Yeah. I think he's in jail now, but he is in jail. <laughs> he's still in jail. I mean, this human piece of garbage, I said it, not you, uh, is like buying drugs that's where that are a, abandoned. Yeah. That's where there's a lapse in how, you know, the laws around generic drugs. Like uh -huh. that's a, I think that is a problem that can be solved by proper government. What, what intervention. is the problem there? You... Um, with that one specific, I don't know the specifics of the, the drug he bought. But, but I would that like abandoned drug thing seems to be like or yeah, cause abandoned diseases. Because in theory, like just take, you know, I don't know, in a vacuum, you've got some free markets, right? If, if someone's able to take some abandoned drug off the street, basically, and jack up the price, that means com competition should come in easily and right. undercut them and you get a more market-based price. And so sometimes there are laws that get in the way of that that maybe mm. make it so that the companies who have the brand name drug ha are very difficult about allowing their competitors to test a generic and so forth. So there's a lot of nuance there and I, I don't want to... This material yeah. science thing is getting big too, huh? Mm -hmm. I know that nanotubes and all that kind of stuff was really big in the 90s, mm -hmm. but it seems like there's other stuff going on right now. There, We're beyond the plastics era. Yeah, I mean, plastics, nylon, that stuff is like, a, it's 100 years old. We haven't had big breakthroughs in materials in a, in a long time. But, you know, with biology, you're seeing people are re-engineering organisms to produce materials that are typically hard to produce or have new properties. Maybe they're extra huh. strong or something like that. So a great example are the you know, folks on the East Bay Bolt Threads who, you know, they produce spider silk using yeast and, and now mushroom leather Spi as spider well. Spider silk. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, spider silk, but no spiders. Yeah, no, no. I, 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 I was a big fan of Marvel Comics when I was a kid. <laughs> I understand what they're doing. They're literally making web slinging. Me, yeah, I'm sure it's a secret. It's the first step to making Spider-Man. <laughs> I know what these guys are doing over there. They just want to be Spider-Man. <laughs> I mean, it is, that's going to be the ultimate is when you're going to be able to flip your DNA to become a, or, you know, and do something to become a superhero. I may take the over 20 years on that one. All right. Ah. The ability to increase muscle mass and all that stuff already exists, right? Mm -hmm. We have that. But to literally like increase the number of IQ points and, and other stuff, that's upon us, right? In the next couple of decades? Yeah. It, it I, yes. <laughs> Is there any downside to increasing everybody on the planet's intelligence by 10% if it was equally distributed? I don't, it's probably not as simple. There's not one magic IQ gene that we can yeah. turn the crank on and make everyone smarter. Yeah. It's probably more, there's a lot of different factors in there mm. that are hard to control for. So I don't think we totally understand that. But I mean, it mm. kind of, you've got to think about it. Like a lot of this stuff happens through nature already. You have mm. parents who value education and have kids, raise their kids. Have, like that's that selection process already happening. Yeah. And so, you know, yeah, but we might be able to speed it up. Oh my God, if I got those extra 10 IQ points and I went to MIT, oh boy. <laughs> you seem I'd to be, be doing your, okay. I'm doing okay. You yeah. seem to be doing okay. Yeah, well, you know, you just find the people who did go to MIT and you invest in them. And you'll be just <laughs> fine. You'll be just fine. Uh, all right, listen, Saji, great to get to know you. I'm going to get you an invite to the poker game uh, and uh, I'll get my, this is good. Now I got my Sri Lankan squad. All three of us in the Bay All area. three of you. Yeah. I've got all three of you. There's no Sri Lankan... Um, my Sri Lankan Avengers. Yes, yeah, very good punch up. Um, is there a Sri Lankan restaurant here? Uh, 
There's one. Any good? What's a signature dish in Sri Lankan cuisine? Uh, I mean, a lot of curries. A lot it's of not, It's not too different from South Indian food, Got actually. It. Like South Indian, yeah. yeah, yeah. You get the chicken uh, makhni. I don't know yeah. if that's North Indian, actually. That may be North Indian. Yeah. All right, listen, Saji, great work. If you are uh, a software engineer and uh, you want to work for a company that's changing the world. Please join Benchling. <laughs> please join Benchling. He needs engineers. Go yeah. get him. Uh, great job. And thank you for the work you're doing for humanity. It's really awesome, dude. I sincerely mean that. Okay, we'll see you all next time. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye.